We have the first session with Mr. William Dalimbul titled Late Mughal Poet Princess. Let me introduce the speaker of the day, Mr. William Dalimbul. He's one of Britain's great historians and the recipient of the Wolfson Prize, the Duff Cooper Prize and the Hemingway Prize. He's the best-selling author of City of Jinns, From the Holy Mountain, Age of Kali, White Mughals, The Last Mughal, Nine Lives, Return of a King in Kohinoor. His recent publication is titled The Company Quartered. Let's all wholeheartedly welcome him to the session, the late Mughal poet, Princess. Hi, good morning. I'm going to speak today about two of the four books of the company quartet that I've been working on for the last 20 years. And I realize that there's actually something that connects two of them very closely, which is the characters of two of the least regarded and most neglected of the late Mughal emperors, Shah Alam and Bahadur Shah Zafar. Both, I think, are widely regarded as failures. Shah Alam is remembered as the victim of the terrible atrocity of Ghulam Qadir, who came and blinded him with his own thumbs, poking his eyes out, this hideous end, leaving this terrible symbol of a blind emperor in a ruined palace. Zafar, likewise, is regarded as the man who lost 1857, despite being at the helm of the greatest and largest anti-colonial uprising in history, that uprising was defeated due to lack of organization, uh, and Zafar famously ended his life in exile in Burma, uh, and is not regarded by anyone as a great hero. However, both men were, I think, extraordinary human beings. Both pioneered and struggled against defeat and loss and failure, and neither gave up. Both fought on uh, in very, very difficult circumstances. And above all, both were great poets and writers, and left a model of civilized princely behavior which stands out even today. The Delhi in which both their lives were framed was in the youth of Shah Alam and towards the end of Zafar's life, the greatest and largest city in India. We have, um, if you look at the slide here, uh, an image produced in the 1840s, but not hugely different from what would have been the situation uh, in the 1750s when um, uh, Shah Alam was growing up. And this is a view from the top of the Lahore Gate uh, of the Red Fort, and you can see here from it across to the Jama Masjid and down the Chandi Chowk. And this was the most elegant, refined, and civilized capital. The largest city in between Istanbul to the west and Edo, Imperial Tokyo, to the east. And in the youth of Shah Alam, it was still the largest city in India. A million people lived within its walls. And it was also the richest city. The Mughals had taken to it everything that they had gathered and plundered from the rest of South Asia. And it's important to remember, today in Bollywood, the Mughals are framed often sitting in palaces with sort of fluttering pigeons and uh, dropping sort of slices of mangoes into concubines' uh, mouths and so on. 
It's important to re remember that that level of luxury and refinement was built up on the back of an extraordinary economic power. We think of the Mughals after years of propaganda as plunderers and looters, and yet it is largely thanks to the incredible growth of the textile industry under their rule that India became for the first time since antiquity a larger producer of, uh, of GDP than China, the largest economy in the world. In the youth of Shah Alam, India as a whole was still producing about 40% of the world's GDP. And much of that was coming from textile production. Out of India came not only fancy silks and embroideries and kalamkaris, but also simply the cheapest and best quality cotton in the world. Uh, and this was being exported around the world, usually by European exporters, of whom initially the East India Company was only one among many. So much so that you get, by the 1750s, deindustrialization in Mexico, as far away as, uh, as Latin America, uh, because of the sheer quantity of cheap, very high quality cotton arriving there from India. So just as the world is incredibly globalized at this period, we think of the present day as being the first period that, uh, that globalization took place. But just as the production of gold in Latin America affected the economies of South Asia, so the production of cotton in India affects the economies as far away as Latin America. And the symbol of this decadent rich capital initially is Mohammed Shah Rangila, who of course comes to a, uh, uh, an abrupt uh, termination of the golden age of his rule with the arrival of this man, Nader Shah. And Nader, as grim as he looks in this portrait, was from humble background, self-made man. His father was a farrier, made fur hats in, in, uh, near Herat, in what's now the uh, Persian-Afghan borderlands. Uh, he rose to power as a general in the Safavid army in Isfahan and eventually overthrew the Safavids to take power himself. And was someone who took very seriously the business of military technology and who developed uh, a new form of horse-borne cannon that acted for the period rather like a light tank these heavy gazelles that they fixed up with um, a sort of tripod from a saddle and the horse's bridle uh, were armor-piercing. You can see examples today uh, in the National Museum of Delhi still. And uh, were able to take on his two main enemies, which were the Russians coming south under Peter the Great from Petersburg and the Ottomans who were encroaching on the Safavids uh, from the West. And in the late 1730s, Nader Shah decides that he needs money to take on these two adversaries. So plans what is initially just a raid on Mughal Afghanistan. Uh, he told his personal physician, who recorded it in his diary, that he wished to pluck some golden feathers from the Mughal peacock's tail. So he goes into Afghanistan, which is then the summer capitals of the Mughal Empire. We always think of Kashmir as being the summer capital because it's within India, forgetting that there's the whole of Pakistan and Afghanistan, which was also uh, a central part of the Mughal Empire. And he finds there's no resistance, that the local Mughal militias just crumble, so he carries on. He comes down the Khyber Pass, takes Peshawar, then he takes Lahore. And finally, he confronts the Mughals at the Battle of Karnal uh, in 1739. And the Battle of Karnal is one of the kind of most extraordinary defeats. The Mughals have, according to some accounts, nearly a million men under arms. But it's a completely disorganized army. The generals are fighting with each other. 
And uh, more to the point, Nadia has these armor-piercing gazelles. And at the last minute, the Mughals charge forward. They have a, almost a mile of heavy Mughal armor charging forward in the sunlight. And at the last minute, the light Persian cavalry parts like a curtain, revealing this line of horse-borne gazelles in front of them. Five minutes later, it's all over. The cream of Mughal chivalry lies dead in the ground. And that evening, Nadir Shah, on the right of this picture, invites Muhammad Shah Rangila on the left to dinner. And idiotically, Muhammad Shah Rangila goes with his dancing girls, with his musicians, and accepts this uh, Persian dinner, at the end of which, predictably, he's told that he's now the guest of Nadir Shah, and he will not be going back to the Mughal camp. And he's invited to invite his family and bring as many people as he likes, but he's now Nadir's guest, and he has no power to, uh, to resist this. Several days later, they march into Delhi together on the back of Nadir's elephant. There is a, a resistance from the people of Delhi, a massacre, and a, an indemnity is imposed on Delhi. Six weeks later, Nadir leaves Delhi with 8,000 wagons filled with gold, with the Kohinoor. Uh, with the Darya Noor, which was larger than the Koinor. We forget about the Darya Noor because uh, it never became the center of movies or Victorian novels, but uh, it's still sitting in, in Tehran uh, and is the sister diamonds of the Koinor. Um, all the Mughal thrones. The whole lot is taken away to Herat. And in the aftermath of that, it's like you put out the boiler that's keeping the Mughal Empire functioning. There is no money to pay the army. There is no money to pay uh, the officials and the governors and so on. And if you were to take a mirror and fling it from the top of a top story building here in Calicut and see the mirror crash to the ground, that's what happens to the Mughal Empire in the aftermath of this. It shatters into a million fragments. Lucknow, Hyderabad, Jaipur, Jobpur, Udaipur, Tanjore. All these different city-states uh, appear where once there had been a single polity uh, of, uh, uh, of the entire South Asia. Not just modern India, but modern Bangladesh, Pakistan, and most of Afghanistan, and even a slither of Iran. That shatters overnight. And this is the world that the young Shah Alam grows up in. And Shah Alam is this very charming, educated young man, born simply at the wrong time. Today, India is very self-confident. Uh, whatever you think of this government, there is a sense uh, of progress and, uh, and an economy that's improving. And people are generally optimistic about the future. The exact opposite was true of the youth of Shah Alam. There was an awareness that everything was fading, that there was weakness, that there was vulnerability. And he grows up in the much diminished world uh, of uh, uh, mid-18th century Delhi uh, and is uh, given small jobs in the vicinity of Haryana um, because it's literally all now the Mughals are left with. He's the Keeladar of a little fort in Hansi in his youth. And eventually, amid all the assassinations of his father and various machinations within the court, he has to flee to Bihar. Uh, and we have this picture of him left by uh, a French mercenary. If I can find it. Jean Law, who was the son of the man who had founded the French East India Company, bumps, almost by chance, into Shah Alam in the middle of Bihar. And he describes the man in this picture you have in front of you. He is above average height with attractive features, but a surprisingly dark complexion, writes Law. The Shahzada had the best education and has benefited greatly from it. All that I observe seem very favorable. He's well-versed in all the languages of India and in history. He's familiar with Arabic, Persian, Turkey, 
and fluent in the Hindustani language. He loves reading and never passes a day without employing some time in it. He is of an inquiring mind and naturally gay and free in his private society, where he frequently admits his principal officers who he has confidence and dines with them. I've often had this honor. So this is this sort of very promising young man that in a slightly different period of history could have been expected to have excelled. But it's his ill fortune that he's up against the new invaders of India, who for once are not the Persians, not the Afghans, uh, not raiders from the Northwest, but instead, bizarrely, are a, a pair of for-profit corporations. In Pondicherry, the French company des Andes, and in Calcutta, and with outposts all along this coast, at Telicherry, for example, uh, the East India Company. And the East India Company has imported to India the new military technologies that have been developed by Frederick the Great in Prussia. Frederick the Great has used 18th century ballistics and, uh, and advances in science and armory techniques to build an absolutely indefeatable army. And this type of warfare is imported both by the French and the British. And for a long time, it's not clear which of these two corporations is going to, uh, is going to succeed. This is what the Madras sepoys look. It looks like a, a pride parade with all these little shorts that they're in. But uh, these were actually the cutting edge sort of, uh, um, uh, I don't know, probably not the right to talk about the IDF at the moment as the cutting edge army, considering the disgrace that they've made of themselves. But I don't know, whatever the, um, whatever, uh, the, uh, the, the, the best trained army in the world is at this moment. And uh, they used camel, art, uh, horse artillery, mobile uh, units of musketry to defeat far, far larger Mughal cavalry formations. And you have in Madras in 1730, around the same time as Nadir Shah is defeating uh, the, the Mughals, you have the Nawab of the Carnatic uh, with 30,000 cavalry being defeated by only 1,000 of these sepoys. And it all runs out of this building, one of the weirdest and strangest bits of history, that India is invaded and taken over by one London office building. And this is it. It's not a very grand building. Look at it. It's five windows wide. It's not even the two buildings on the side. It's just the one in the center. That is the office of the East India Company at the time of the Battle of Plassey and Buxar. Uh, how on earth does one London business in a country that has at that stage a fraction of the economy of Mughal India, how does it defeat the mass armies of Mughal India, the Marathas, Tipu Sultan, the Nawabs of Hyderabad, all these different armies? The answer is it does it through the collaboration of Indian bankers. The Mawari bankers realize early on that though the East India Company may loot, may pillage, may do a million terrible things, they repay their debts on time with interest and honor their commercial contracts. While with the Marathas, if you lend to Shivaji or one of his things, and you would ask for a loan back with interest, you're as likely to be hung up by your ankles uh, and, uh, and spanked or given, a, uh, given a, a disrespectful exit from court. The East India Company realizes, because it's a corporation, to respect and to uh, honor and to give tax-free status to bankers, which is why half of the Mawari banking community moves from Jodhpur at this period to Calcutta and funds an extraordinary transformation whereby the company recruits 95% Indian armies by offering double the pay that Tipu or the Mughals, or triple the pay in some cases, that the Mughals offer, double what Tipu offers. So the company 
borrows Indian capital to buy Indian mercenaries. It's incomprehensible to us today with our ideas of nationalism and patriotism and, and beating our chest to the flag raising and all the rest of it. But that is how a commercial company took over India. And Calcutta is like Dubai or Singapore. You can live there tax-free if you're a banker. You pay not one penny to the government, but you are expected to put your capital at the disposal of the East India Company during a war, and you will get full interest, and they will repay on time with interest without any problems. And that way, these great business houses grow, and you have different banking communities, Jains and Hindus, competing to lend money to the company and fund an ever larger growing sepoy army. And things begin to take on a particularly sinister turn when this guy turns up. This is the young Robert Clive, who arrives back in India for his second session uh, in 1756, thanks, just like the Gulf War, to faulty intelligence. Uh, a, a report appears that the French have sent a fleet to India, and Clive is sent in pursuit of it. He arrives off the coast of Madras expecting to find an empty city with smoke rising from the ruins. In reality, there was no French fleet going to India. It was actually going to Canada. If any of you have seen um, uh, The Last of the Mohicans, Daniel Day-Lewis leaping over Canadian waterfalls, that sort of thing. That's where the army was going. And so Clive arrives to find he's in the wrong continent, uh, and there is no French army, and his credibility is saved by the fact that shortly afterwards, entirely by chance, Siraj Dowler attacks and takes Calcutta. So Clive, who is anchored uselessly off the coast of Madras, merely has to sail up the coast, liberate Calcutta, and just as he's about to go back down to Madras with at least something to show for his trip out to India, a message arrives from the Jagat Sets, who are the great bankers of Murshidabad, who've invented a sort of Hundi system of loans, which allows them to transmit tax revenues in a very unstable India by credit notes from Bengal or Hyderabad or wherever to Delhi and take 10% cut along the way. And this is considered a much better bet in the times of instability than putting gold onto a bullock cart and trying to get it through Bihar and UP. Uh, instead, you just pay the Jagat sets in Mashidabad or Hyderabad or Avad, and they, then you can draw it in Delhi. The, uh, the Mashidabad Jagat sets call in Clive and said, we've seen what you've done getting Calcutta back. Why don't you finish the job? And they present a plan. And it turns out that Siraj Dowler's principal general, Mir Jaffa, is also in on the plot. He's also been bribed by the Jagat Sets. So while British history books still have this sort of image of heroic Clive defeating the, Mo uh, defeating the wicked Siraj Dowler, in reality it's a stitch-up organized by the bankers. Uh, and the bankers uh, uh, bribes play their role, and halfway through the battle, Mir Jaffa walks off the battlefield. The next day, Clive is in the treasury in Mushidabad, filling his pockets with diamonds and loading punts full of the entire treasury onto the boats which then float down to Fort William with the entire proceeds of the Mushidabad treasury on board. And Shah Alam at this point very nearly takes Mushidabad. He does a surprise maneuver, comes across Bihar into Bengal, and nearly manages to take Mushidabad before Clive gets there. Uh, and it's one of the great forgotten what-ifs of history. If Shah Alam had beaten Clive to Mushidabad, if he had conquered that treasury, if he had taken the treasury rather than Clive, what would have happened? But through various mishaps, it doesn't happen. Uh, uh, Shah Alam is driven back into Bihar, and in 1764, you have the Battle of Buxar, where the East India Company defeats not just Mir Qasim of Bengal, but also Shuja Udawla of Avad and Shah Shuja. All three of the great Mughal commanders of North India are defeated, and immediately after that, 
you get the signing of the Diwani. When Shah Alam is seen here in a, in, in a very uh, inaccurate image uh, produced in London from imagination, has almost no bearing on the actual reality which took place within a tent uh, uh, on a... Uh, Shah Alam got put on a chair draped over a table and he had to sign, he said, uh, uh, this document, the Diwani, which according to the Mughal historian uh, Ghulam Hussein Khan was signed in less time than would normally take to sell a jackass at a market. So this poor man is forced into signing this thing and he gives away the right to run the economy of the three richest provinces, Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. In the UK at the moment, we have this company 4GS that takes over prisons on a commercial basis and runs them rather than having the economy. This is the sort of thing we're talking about here. The East India Company, a for-profit corporation, takes over the running of the economy. And of course, like any corporation, it bleeds it dry. It asset strips, to use the modern terminology. And in the course of the next five, six years, Bengal, which is the richest province of India, is bled dry. The money is simply shipped to London. A lot of young men aged about 19 or 20. There's only two and a half thousand East India Company civil servants in India. It's an, a tiny, tiny number. And yet, by using this capital from the bankers, employing Indian mercenaries, they strip the richest province bare. And when you go to Britain today, and you go to one of those gorgeous... 18th century Palladian villas outside London and go to a National Trust house and have a very nice tea in one of those. You are looking at the profits of Mashidabad and the Bengal textile industry shipped bag and baggage to Britain. And my country, Scotland, which was one of the very poorest countries in Europe, in the course of the 18th century becomes one of the very richest on the basis partly of this and partly of the slave trade. And these two very dodgy forms of profit create, move Britain from the bottom or the kind of middling. England is a rich country, but not as rich as Spain, Portugal, or Italy. By the end of the 18th century, it's the largest economy in the world. And Shah Alam moves back to Delhi with all his bags, risks uh, the, uh, the empty city, which has been ravaged about 10 times in his absence by both Marathas coming from the south and Afghans coming from the north, moves back into the Red Fort. But at the meantime, the company's power is growing. With all this money that it's looting out of Bengal, the number of sepoys grows from 20,000 to 40,000. And by 1799, it is 200,000 men, which is double the size of the British army. Remember, this is not the British government. This is a corporation. This is Tata. This is Adani. <laughs> uh, this is what happens when a corporation takes over a government. And in a sense, if you've watched the whole business with the relationship between Adani and this government, you are seeing something pretty close to the relationship with the East India Company and the British government. You have a mutually profitable arrangement whereby the foreign policy of a nation is put at the behest of a, uh, of a, of a for-profit corporation. And it's quids in for everyone. Everyone gains. Uh, and uh, this is exactly what happens in the 18th century here. It ends, of course, in tragedy for Shah Alam. Shah Alam is blinded and, and ends his life uh, a blind poet in a ruined palace. But meanwhile, the company is busy increasing its riches. It suddenly realizes that you can gather from the marginal land enormous profits from the opium poppy. And Bihar, uh, the marginal land in Bihar and Western India, Eastern India, sorry, becomes a, a massive opium uh, growing area which is shipped to China. With the money, they buy tea, which they then ship back to India and to Britain and to America. Hang on, we got the wrong slides here. Here we are. And the Boston Tea Party, where, uh, when tea is thrown into Boston Harbor at the beginning of the American Revolution, that is East India Company tea. And, the, and one of the forgotten 
causes the American Revolution is that the Americans are terrified the East India Company is going to be unleashed on them. And they've heard about the famine in Bengal. They've heard about the stripping of... of and there's a whole range of PhDs still to be written on the effects of the fear of the East India Company on the early um, uh, American patriots. But to go back, the East India Company now has enlarged its premises so that it looks a bit like Buckingham Palace. Uh, and it has this extraordinary docks um, uh, which produces, I think, 100 clippers a month. So that there's tea, opium, silks, cotton being shipped backwards and forwards across the globe. And you have a corporation that is, has a, a slice of the world economy that is about 10 times the size of Microsoft and Apple combined. And it becomes the world's first massive corporation. And it's the first time that you see how a corporation can become a bigger economy than the nation state. We always think in terms of, you know, India is now, whatever it is, the fifth world largest economy. We forget that corporations such as Apple and Microsoft are worth more than the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. And in the East India Company's case, it's worth more than any nation on earth. And so you have, for the first time, this issue whereby not only is the East India Company obviously picking off one by one Tipu Sultan, the Marathas, and all its various enemies here. Yeah, it's also bribing Parliament in, in Britain. And a situation develops very familiar to us today, whereby a corporation subtly alters the foreign policy of a nation. The mysterious process by which campaign donations become foreign policy ideas, which become foreign policy. This very modern situation is invented by the East India Company at this time. And the whole lobbying industry and the whole closeness of politicians to corporations begins with the East India Company. So what looks at first like a piece of very distant history actually becomes the story of our times. And it's the first time that that mysterious alchemy of corporation and political party come together to form our futures, which is why this is terribly important history today. It's not curiosity about the past, it's an example of what the future can be. The East India Company has a familiar looking flag. This is the basis by which the American flag uh, is formed, except with the stars rather than with the Union Jack. So here is poor old Shah Alam ending his day uh, in Delhi, he becomes the first novelist in Urdu, rather amazingly. I will read to you some of his poetry and then a little bit about his novel. The winds of calamity have been unleashed by our mutilation. Our imperial rule has been cruelly laid waste. The exalted son, Aftab, that was his pen name, it's a, it's a pun of kingship, once illuminated the heavens, now we lament the darkness of our ruin as dust descends upon us. This misbegotten son of an Afghan, Ghulam Qadir, scattered our royal dignity. Who now, except God, could befriend us? Rife with danger are the riches and honors of this world. Now fate has rendered our sufferings eternal. Now that this young Afghan has destroyed the dignity of my state, I see none but thee, Most High. Lord, have pity on me, a sinner. And just a word about his novel. He writes a romance, an ambitious 4,000-page book in Urdu called the Ajayb al Qasas. And this is a dastan, a meditation on kingship, and tells the story of a prince and princess tossed back and forth by powers beyond their control from India to Constantinople via various magical islands and fairy, fairy realms. It reflects the prince's sense of helplessness in the hands of fate. Shah Alam's lavish coarse settings of the Dastan contrast, sorry, the lavish settings of the Dastan contrast with the impoverished reality of Shah Alam's daily life. 
under the regime which he had found himself in. So this is also the world under which uh, his grandson, Bahadur Shah Zafar, grows up. And by the time Zafar comes to the throne in 1832, all of that extended Mughal world is gone. Not just Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, but even control of Haryana. Zafar is born into a world where the Mughal controls only the Red Fort. And beyond that, a British resident of the East India Company is in charge. And yet, amazingly, Zafar produces one last great renaissance in Delhi with virtually no resources. He can't build the Taj Mahal. He can't build uh, even, uh, even a new fort. But he does build an empire of the arts. And he is a great calligrapher. This is a picture of him as a calligrapher. This is an example of his calligraphy. He produces book after book of couplets. Even if you can't read the Urdu, you get the impression of this poetic mind scribbling couplet after couplet down the margins in the gutters of his no notebooks. And he has a great line in hats. Uh, and here he is in this extraordinary moment, the golden calm, when the British, who come as enemies and conquerors, are seduced by the sheer attractiveness of this artistic world. And you find this man, Sir David Octoloni, born in Boston, becomes the first British resident, fluent in Persian. He was a British loyalist thrown out by Washington, who escaped at Yorktown, made his way to India, never left. He has famously 16 Indian wives, each with her own elephant, and this is what happens in the evening at, at Octoloni's house. You can see him in a sort of fab India kurta, smoking, it's not clear what, but the slightly glazed look in his eyes, possibly not tobacco. Uh, dancing girls, eunuchs, and best of all, the outraged Scottish ancestors peering down from the picture rail, wondering what uh, David Octoloni's up to. And this is not just one man, it is an entire world. This, by the way, is Octoloni's seal, um, uh, he uh, 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 exists in a sort of parallel world of Persian poetry. Uh, this is his wife's tomb, Mubarak Begum, is the person for whom the last great Mughal tomb is built. It was destroyed in 1857, so it's no longer there. But look at it. It has, on, on the top of the dome, it has a cross. The only building in the world I know that has a minaret and the cross in the same, or many minarets and a cross on the same building. Uh, and it's a measure of this sort of world. So this is my wife's ancestor, William Fraser, who arrives as a slightly sort of snotty Scottish aristocrat uh, in 1805, is seduced by this world. This is him in Calcutta winning his gold medal at Fort William College uh, in uh, Hindustani and calligraphy. Those are his calligraphy pens in his hands. He's still got his Scottish hat on, but ever, uh, below the nose, he's becoming more and more mogul. And this is what he looks like by the time he gets to Delhi. Uh, he's wearing a sort of Rohit Bal wedding ensemble or a Tarun Tahiliani uh, outfit. and becomes a sort of model for late mogul fashions. Um, here he is at the end. So, again, a sort of forgotten moment that sort of doesn't fit in any of our history textbooks of, this, of these Brits turned white Mughals seduced by this world, but it doesn't last. Uh, it's too weird uh, to last. Mo this is William Fraser's uh, mother-in-law's village. Um, and this, in a second, is William Fraser's mother-in-law's buffalo. These are all pictures that he commissions. Uh, these are the local landowners. And this is his manservant, Kala, uh, seen in the left picture as he arrived out of the Haryana jungle to uh, apply for, uh, for a, a job. And, and after a, a blow dry and a haircut and a bit of a shower, uh, how he looked uh, by the time he entered William Fraser's service in a sort of mock Napoleonic outfit with a kind of shavite tiger skin thing going on in the, in the, in the, in the shako, the hat. Um, again, this sort of bizarre half Napoleonic, half shavite, half, uh, half East India Company, part Mughal world with dancing girls and Skinner as his best friend. Skinner's yellow boys living in this world somewhere between the Marathas, the Mughals and the British. Nawab Judger taking his elephant for a, for a ride, taking his tiger for a ride. The Begum Samru in Sardana, 
building the largest Roman Catholic cathedral in North India, uh, serviced by Father Julius Caesar from Rome. I mean, it's a bizarre and sort of extraordinary world. But it comes to a sort of grinding halt in the 1830s under the Metcalfs. You can see Thomas Metcalf in black and white amid the peacocks of the Mughal th uh, court, standing out like a sore thumb. And this distance grows in the course of the 1840s and 50s. Here's Metcalf on his elephant. He joins in the processions, but his job now is trying to get Zafar out of the Red Fort, trying to get the Red Fort turned into a British barracks, trying to marginalize and kick out the Mughals from their, uh, from their own last remaining property, the Red Fort. And Zafar still looks magnificent, but the peacock throne is not the real peacock throne. It's just made of wood now. Long gone as the gold and jewels of the real peacock throne disappeared off with Nadir Shah a hundred years earlier. And as the British begin to irritate more and more people, uh, toppling Rani Jansi, toppling the Nawabs of Avad, gradually distancing themselves with a new wave of evangelical civil servants reading the, the Ten Commandments to their, uh, to their servants, generals reading the Bible to their sepoys. There, it grows an atmosphere whereby the sepoys believe uh, that there's actually a plot to convert them by force to Christianity. So when, in the aftermath of the Afghan War of 1839, when the British are comprehensively outshot by the Afghans' jazails, a new rifle is introduced, the Lee-Enfield rifle. And the Lee-Enfield rifle armory in Dum Dum outside Calcutta screws up the manufacture of the new cartridges and produces these cartridges so covered in gloop that's the lubricant to get it down the muzzle-loading rifles that when the, the sepoys have to bite it, it's like biting on a tin of Vaseline. Disgusting. The British troops hate it because it tastes disgusting. But the rumor goes round that this is pig fat and cow fat. It may be true. There's no evidence there was a, any deliberate uh, idea of converting by force, but this is believed because enough of the generals and enough of the civil servants are evangelical Christians who are producing, for example, the Reverend Jennings is now in the Lahore Gate of the Red Fort with a printing press producing Islamophobic and anti-Hindu tracts. And so these guys have become so offensive and so different from the white Mughals that the sepoys believe that there is a conspiracy to convert them. And on the 10th of May, 1857, the new rifles are issued in Meerut. The veterans who had fought in Afghanistan refuse to bite the bullet, which is where that phrase comes from. And they are arrested and sentenced to heavy, uh, heavy labor. So obviously unjust is this on medal-winning veterans of the Afghan campaign that the troops rise up, goaded on by the prostitutes and the girls and the bazaars, and they murder their officers in Evensong on the night of the 10th of May, 1857, and ride to Delhi and arrive the following morning over the bridge of boats. The massacres that take place are not just of the British, it's of all the Christians, and it has a strongly anti-Christian tone, which doesn't appear in nationalist history books, but is there very clearly in the, in the, uh, the rebels' own writings. And there's a lot of talk in the Delhi Urdu Akbar about jihad, the example of the Mahabharat for Hindus, and so on. And uh, the Gita is discussed as an uh, uh, example of how you should perform your duty and make war. By the end of May 1857, having defeated every princely force, it is the East India Company's own sepoys that nearly toppled the East India Company. Out of 139,000 mercenary sepoys, sorry, out of 169 mercenary, uh, uh, 169,000 mercenary sepoys, 130,000, in other words, about four-fifths, turned their guns on their officers, and 100,000 
go to Delhi and ask Zafar to lead them in battle. But Zafar, who had been a great horseman and an athlete and a huntsman in his youth, is now 82 years old and senile. He's no Che Guevara. He's completely the wrong person. He can do a good mushaira. He can lead a, a, a wonderful poetry evening, but he's not the man to lead uh, an uprising against the strongest colonial power in the world. And through lack of organization and inefficiency by the younger Mughal princes, the uprising fails. And in, by September, the British have got a new army together in the Punjab and the Northwest Frontier. They march them down the Grand Trunk Road to Delhi and arrive on the 13th of September before the walls of Delhi, which they then bombard. The following day, they go in. And there takes place one of the most terrible massacres in colonial history, which bizarrely has left very little record in the popular consciousness for, compared with, for example, the far smaller massacre at Jallianwala Bagh 60 years later, which is remembered in films and novels and poetry and song. Uh, there's almost no songs or poetry or movies about the taking of Delhi, but about 100,000 civilians are massacred in that month in terrible retributions, hangings, princes are brought back, anyone remotely involved. The archive that I used to write Last Mogul, the book that talks about this, uh, is called The Mutiny Papers, and that is the leftover of the prosecution case in the trials that followed 1857, because they gathered all the materials of the mutineers in Delhi, the camp, the fort, and gathered, and this, if your name appeared on any slip of paper, uh, you could be called back, hung, uh, without, without trial. Zafa is called, uh, is, is, is taken refuge in Humayun's tomb. Hodson, William Hodson, goes to arrest him, and a deal has been stitched up whereby his life has been promised to him. But he isn't taken back to the uh, Diwani Khas, which is now an officer's mess, where pork is served, in, where once the Mughals sat uh, dispensing justice. Instead, Zafar is put in a stable, and this is the famous picture uh, of Zafar during his trial. Uh, he was senile even before 1857. By the end of 1857, having seen his sons shot in front of him, he has become this tragic wreck of a man, winding and unwinding his turban. And we have this wonderful description by um, the Times correspondent, William Howard Russell, going into the stables where he's being kept, and he finds Zuffer being sick into a basin in this hideous stable, about to be deported. And the British press, rather like um, with Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War, whatever, have built up Zafar to be this sort of sinister figure at the heart of the uprising. And Russell expects to find someone like the kind of James Bond villain with a white cat uh, in a sort of uh, um, uh, in a palace pulling all the strings. Instead, he finds this broken man on a charpoy. And this wonderful description, he writes, of Zafar, who's been deprived deliberately of pen and paper, writing couplets on the wall of the stables with a burnt stick. He hasn't got pen, he hasn't got paper, but he's still the poet. Now, there's huge dispute over whether those verses written on the walls of the stables and in exile are the famous final lines attributed to him, which do not appear in his Duan. Some, including Javed Akta, think it's all a myth. Others, such as Irfan Habib, think that they are the real things because they, have been, they were being recited on the steps of the Jama Masjid within a short period of um, Zafar's death. Either way, I'm going to end just by reading to you a wonderful translation of Zafar's verse uh, done by Ahmed Ali himself a Delhi exile in Karachi, uh, which he gave to me, uh, and which I published for the first time here. What Ali's done is put together diverse couplets from the last divan, 
and those attributed to him, possibly wrongly, uh, into a single, rather sort of Tennysonian poem. Um, and I'm just going to read that. I love it. Uh, so this is Zafar channeled by Ahmed Ali. And it's dedicated, incidentally, to Zinat Mahal, the final, much younger wife of Zafar. Um, and these early verses are love poems that Zafar wrote to her. This is her in old age, in, uh, photographed uh, in Delhi. But imagine a much younger woman in her 20s when he's writing this. When in silks you came and dazzled me with the beauty of your spring, you brought a flower to bloom, love within your being. You lived with me, breath of my breath, being in my being, nor left my side. But now the wheel of time has turned and you are gone. No joys abide. You pressed your lips upon my lips, your heart upon my beating heart. And I have no wish to fall in love again, for they who sold love's remedy have shut shop, and I seek in vain. My life now gives no ray of light. I bring no solace to heart or eye. Out of dust to dust again, of no use to anyone am I. Delhi was once a paradise where love held sway and reigned, but its charm lies ravished now, and only ruins remain. No tears were shed when shroudless they were laid in common graves. No prayers were read for the noble dead. Unmarked remain their graves. The heart distressed, the wounded flesh. The mind ablaze, the rising sigh. The drop of blood, the broken heart. Tears on the lashes of the eye. But things cannot remain, O oh, Zafar, thus. For who can tell? Through God's great mercy and the prophet, all may yet be well. Thank you very much. Hi, William. I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Please uh, record your books as audio books. I will just say that. Um, <laughs> I got turned down. I've got too lispy a voice. Oh. I, I uh, auditioned twice and they, they got actors in. Anyway, I, next I time I'll that. insist. <laughs> um, but I was going to ask if you could talk a bit about your process and just kind of um, how you begin a book and, and how you follow a story and kind of come to um, what you're going to tell. Yeah, thank you. So very briefly, the most difficult thing is finding the topic and working your way around it. And I'm facing that now because I'm just coming to the end of my current book and I've no idea what my next one's going to be. And the, uh, this anxiety begins to set in. But in the course of a year of publication and a book launch, I'm reading frantically around looking for subjects and by hopefully by the time the book is launched, uh, the next one is sort of vaguely underway. Uh, I start off by reading the secondary stuff, the stuff already written on any subject, um, and noticing where the archives and the primary sources are, and that's the lovely year. You're sitting often, you know, ideally on a sofa or on a sunbed or somewhere nice, reading interesting books on a subject you love. But then follows the slightly harder year when you're into the archives and you're off somewhere, often sort of somewhere like Tonk or somewhere uh, where you don't particularly want to be for any extended period of time, um, in the archives, negotiating with archivists, which is not no easy thing in this country, uh, and uh, trying to get access to photograph and, and get these primary sources. I have lost my long-term Persian translator who's worked with me on the last four books, Bruce Winnell, who was uh, my best friend and, and long-term collaborator, died of cancer just before Anarchy was published, or just after Anarchy was published. Um, so I, I'm now slightly, uh, I've lost the key to the magic cupboard uh, in some ways. But uh, um, then I have another year when I'm sitting down with all my materials, hopefully 
gathered when you collate them all. And I have two ways of collating them, which is I have old-fashioned card indexes arranged by people, places, and topics. Three boxes, which then can often grow to 12 boxes if it's a long book. Uh, but those are the three divisions. And a dateline, so that when you come to write about, say, the Battle of Blassie or the Battle of Bucks, you've got all the references and know where you can find it. Because the crucial thing is that when you're actually writing, it should be like, I compare it to Chinese cooking as opposed to Indian cooking. And, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a process whereby you spend hours cutting things up and getting them ready, but the actual process of, of cooking should be as quick as possible. It should only be a, a flash fry. And in an ideal world, I will then actually write the book in, in six months, so often it takes longer. Um, and that six months is the, is, the, is the hard work when you don't go out, you don't go to parties, um, you ha don't drink, and it's, it's, it's generally quite unpleasant, but it's the, it's the one bit of the job that is unpleasant, the producing and actually writing the bloody book. <laughs> and, then, um, and then about sort of four or five months of editing, it always takes far longer than you think it's going to take, and getting the bibliographies and the no notes, and then you send it off, and the whole thing begins round again. It's a five-year cycle for me. Hello, sir. This Hello, guy sir. here is also uh, next up. But, yeah. Hello, sir. It's uh, finally uh, nice meeting you in person. <laughs> nice to meet you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I have read most of your books. Uh, I enjoy reading uh, Mughal history. Uh, in city of Calicut, you have come and uh, you have uh, brought us through uh, a short history in a short time of the entire Mughal period. That's very wonderful. It was very nice hearing it from you. Uh, and in this uh, city of Calicut, where um, literature and art is a great thing. And um, would you please acknowledge uh, the various um, Mughal princesses, or the poets, uh, like uh, maybe Jahana Rabigam or Sebunisa. Uh, would you please uh, tell us a uh, slight uh, few history about them also? I'm ashamed to say I don't know my Calicut Zamorin history at all, and I should know that, so I'm not going to even bluff on that one. But... Uh, um, what I am doing in my current book, which I'm just completing, is writing a lot about this area at the time of the Romans and the, uh, the Muziris Red Sea trade and the degree. There is a papyrus now in Vienna, which is a loan contract taken out by a probably Jewish Alexandrian Greek merchant in um, Alexandria for a consignment of high-value goods from Moziris. And it has, unbelievable, something like 64 tons of ivory, um, 40 boxes of nard, which is, if any of you know your St. Matthew's Gospel, it's what Martha smears over the feet of Christ in, uh, uh, in the Gospels. Uh, it's, a, it's a highly valued ointment produced from Himalayan um, goats, I think, or something like that, um, and um, pepper, lots and lots of pepper and lots of cotton. And the value of this one consignment which is given would have been enough to uh, project the merchant who sold it into the Roman Senate. The Roman Senate, I, think, I can't remember how many, a million sesterces or something was the, was the wealth level to get you into the Senate. Uh, and so the, the fortunes being made are such that some economic historians are now suggesting that the Red Sea customs take at the ports of Myas Hormos and Berenike, where the goods from Kerala and also Arabia and Aksum, the Ethiopian... Uh, trade arrived, was sufficient to bring in one-third of the Roman imperial budget. A third of the Roman imperial budget came from the customs on goods exported largely from here. So this is a whole different ballpark of the value of, in the first century AD, of goods from India coming out of what's now Kerala. Not Calicut, but Maziris, Kodungalore, and Cochin. Uh, and so anyway, that's the starting point of my current book, which I hope I will be talking about to you next year.
So uh, lots of lots of Kerala next year. Hello. Yeah. Um, so in the interest of time, we'll have to wrap up this discussion. There's one guy who had his had his hand straight up. Quickly, a, a yeah, short I'll one. Just keep it short. Uh, thank you for that most engrossing session. Uh, my question picks up uh, from where you left off. So as we all know, the how the current regime wants to wipe off uh, bits of Mughal history from the textbooks. So I'm sure similar attempts would have been made by the British in the aftermath, right in the aftermath of the 1857 revolt. So can you give a transparency of history as to how the, there was a, uh, an, an attempt to alter the historiography during that period and how the same has been done this day? So it's no secret that history is written always by the victors. But it is also true that uh, you know, the vanquished documents often remain and it's the job of the historian to go and seek them out. And it's certainly true that governments anywhere in the world, and it's not just the government here, but in other countries, can privilege one version of history over another. And you see this, you know, I work a lot in the Middle East, and it's not just the Israelis who give a version of, of, you know, of the history of Israel-Palestine that is Palestinian-free, you find similar reworkings of history in Arab states where the Turkish uh, period is, is, is removed and so on. So this is something that happens. And luckily, history doesn't stop at the school book. Historians can continue to write, can continue to discuss. Uh, and even if a government does not sponsor one particular version of history, the historian is free to write and publish uh, as they wish. Sometimes in exile, but hopefully not. Uh, and it's the job of the historian to get the truth as they see it out. And the truth will change as the present changes. Things take on new significance as events change. So I don't think I would have been interested in the East India Company had we not had this period where suddenly Apple and Microsoft and Twitter and Google were suddenly these enormous, vast, imperial corporations things look different as the present changes. So historians' work is never done, but it's their job, certainly, to tell the truth to the best of their ability from their own perspective. And, and that will be superseded in generations to come. My books, future generations will look at them and say, rubbish, and, and there'll be a whole new sets of documents found somewhere to disprove everything I've written. You know, and That is the fate of the historian, but you have your brief moment in the sun, you hope. Anyway, thank you, I'll be signing books.